So a lot has happened uh, since I've seen many of you in this room last. Yesterday, I was just right down the street. I was at the cathedral and I was ordained as a deacon. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and the caller is going to take some getting used to and you guys are going to have a harder time telling me, Neil, and Trent apart. So it was already hard before, now it's impossible. Uh, deacons are one of the three ordained ministries here at the Episcopal Church. Uh, and it's a very old tradition. It began back in the early church in Acts chapter 6, when the apostles ordained people to feed the widows and the poor uh, while they were going out and preaching the word, evangelizing. And so today, deacons continue this ministry. They continue to minister outside the four walls of the church. I am a transitional deacon, which means I will only be a deacon for six months, and then I will also be a priest. Uh, some people say once a deacon, always a deacon. Every priest was a deacon before they were a priest. Um, so part of the preparation of being a priest is to be a deacon and to serve, to serve in the role of a deacon. So in preparation for my ordination, I wanted to go off to uh, a monastery or a spiritual retreat center in Colorado next to the river, take it easy, pray, be quiet and silent. That's how I wanna spend the week before my ordination. But instead, I went on a mission trip with the youth group, which is the exact opposite of a spiritual <laughs> silent retreat. Um, there was yelling, there was singing, there was hacky sacks everywhere, there was service, there was no sleeping at all, none at all, a lot of creaky beds. It was a really great time. Um, so what we did is our, our youth team, there's a couple adults and uh, a couple youth, about 12 people total, we went to South Carolina and there we served with a bunch of nonprofits in the area. And we, we got to see what life was like in South Carolina and we got to serve the poor along that. And I just gotta say, we have some remarkable high school students at this church. We have some of the best of the best and that really deserves a round of applause. And it's one of the greatest blessings of my life to get to serve alongside them and to serve with them. And so I thought I wanted to sit by a serene river uh, and do some fly fishing and, and a little bit of praying. But instead, what I needed to prepare for my ministry of service as a deacon was to serve along our students. And that was God's blessing to me. When we serve others, we are near to the heart of God. In an acts of service, the church abides, the church lives inside the kingdom of God. So on Monday, we served with an organization called Fields to Families. And so uh, this organization, organization gleans fields uh, on some of the little island farms out in South, South Carolina. And so what they do is they take the food and they, they take it to food banks, they take it to homeless shelters, they take it to uh, places like that so that people can prepare the food and serve it to people or sell it at a lower price. And so if you're not familiar with the term gleaning, uh, it means to gather leftover produce after the harvest has come through. Uh, it's a biblical term. God commands it in Leviticus 19 that you leave some of your produce ungleaned so that the poor and the sojourner is what it says. The poor and the traveler can come and receive food from the gleaning. And so I've read that passage, I've studied before, but it was profound. It was beautiful to actually see it, to actually touch the produce. We we're collecting cabbages. And so it was, it was just amazing to, to walk through and watch our students walk through and pick up the produce that was still salvageable and separate it from what needed to be composting. And so at the very end of our gleaning, there's a volunteer who does this every day. She's given her entire life to this, this ministry, to this service. She gathered us together. <coughs> And she prayed for us and she prayed over us. And after, after that, she invited us to pray the Lord's prayer with her. And so when we got to the part that said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I was moved by the spirit to think of our passage for today. The parables of the harvest, the parables of the seeds growing up. The work that was done in the soil in South Carolina and all the various steps needed to get those heads of cabbage from the ground into the plates of the poor and the powerless. All of that is what we were praying for. We were praying that the kingdom would come on earth, that people would have enough food to eat, that the love of God would be the only thing that exists between neighbor. So I was drawn to see uh, Jesus' heart for the world, the world that we live in now, the lives we live today, as we said that prayer and as I read this passage for today. 
I am not well versed in agricultural metaphors. Uh, I was not raised on a farm. My grandfather was raised on a farm, uh, but I was not. And so I'm not uh, the original audience. I, don't, I didn't understand this without a little bit of research, but Jesus is teaching a crowd that would. They would know exactly what's going on. And the gift is he told them in these parables and we can pick these parables up and we can turn them like a fine gem and examine all the different angles and see how the light goes through it. We can see this beautiful image and there's timeless wisdom and truth for us to learn them. So a little bit of context. Jesus was teaching by the Sea of Galilee in our passage today. And there are so many people pushing in right next to the sea that he had to hop up on a boat or he was gonna get all wet. And so he hopped up on the boat so everybody could see him and he's preaching. And he gives these parables to them. And he's speaking uh, the language of the people. So they were able to hear it, is what the text is, in a language that they could understand, with images they knew. So the very first image, the parable that Jesus gives us today, is comparing the kingdom of God to a seed growing in a harvest. He says a, a, a farmer scatters the seed on the ground. And then although the farmer may tend it, he may water it and may pull some weeds and stuff, the farmer does not cause the growth to happen. That is just simply what the earth does in the soil biome and photosynthesis and all these things that I haven't studied since ninth grade biology. Uh, but the earth does it. The farmer doesn't do it. Uh, and it's a slow process. It takes days and weeks and months and it's so slow that you can sit there and watch and you will not be able to see it happen. You will not be able to see it happen unless you're watching the Discovery Channel and they do a little time lapse and you watch the little thing, you know, we all think it's the coolest thing ever because it, it is cool. And uh, so we, we can't watch it. It's so slow, but you can look back and you can see the tomato plant growing up or the, or the wheat field growing up. You can see it in stages, but you can't watch it. It's so slow. And it culminates with the full grain at the top of the plant and what's called the ear of the plant. So when the grain is ripe, uh, the farmer comes and he harvests the produce. And then with the harvest, he takes the wheat, he grinds it up into flour. And then you can mix flour, water, and yeast, and hopefully a little salt in there, and you can bake a loaf of bread. And so Jesus says that process is what the kingdom of God is like. But immediately Jesus follows it up with another image. Another agricultural parable, he says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, uh, which if you've never seen a mustard seed, go to H-E-B, go to the spice aisle, look down at the M's in the spice aisle and get a mustard seed. It's a little plastic vial and you can see how small they are. They're tiny. They're like the size of a poppy seed. If you've ever seen a poppy seed, they're so tiny. And Jesus calls them the smallest of the seeds. And once it's planted in the ground, it grows to become the largest plant in the garden, in the household garden. And its branches stretch out across over the produce and it provides shade. It provides a home for the birds, a place that they can rest. So this is the other image, a mustard plant growing to maturity. That's what the kingdom of God is like. So the kingdom of God is given to us in these earthy images. There's a temptation to think of Christianity as a pie in the sky religion, which the whole point is to get to heaven. And heaven is the goal. Don't get me wrong, but the mistake is thinking that heaven is this far off place just beyond the rings of Saturn or something like that, that it has nothing to do with the earth that we live on today. Uh, biblical scholar N.T. Wright points out that in the Bible, heaven and earth are portrayed as twin halves of God's creation. And they interlock, they overlap, and they are designed to come together. The salvation that Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of the God is that heaven and earth would come together as the kingdom, as new creation. And we see at the very culmination of the whole entire Bible in Revelation that is a new heavens and a new earth that has been given to us by our Lord Jesus. And so when Jesus preaches the kingdom of God, he's preaching a new creation and he describes that new creation as a seed being scattered in the soil, growing slower than any eye can see. The, Jesus, the language Jesus uses is almost as if this were inevitable. This is just what happens when you put seed down in the soil. The, the farmer doesn't really know how. He can name it. He can put a big word with lots of syllables like photosynthesis on there, but he doesn't do it. He doesn't know how it happens. That is just what creation is for. And the new creation of the kingdom is what creation is for, is what God has done, is what it, it's what it will become. So we don't really know exactly how God does it, but he does it. 
and is what Jesus has done and what is he, it's what he is doing in our midst. And it all culminates like a grain of wheat that is ripe for the harvest and it's harvested up, it's ground into uh, flour and made into bread. And just like when we eat produce from the ground, if we eat a head of cabbage or a loaf of bread, we receive literal energy from it. We receive calories to live our life. We receive our life from the food that we eat. And in the new heavens and the new earth, in the kingdom of God, we receive our life from Jesus, who is the bread of life. And that life, that eternal life that we receive from Christ extends from now all the way to eternity. The kingdom of God brings heaven and earth together. The image of a mustard seed shows us that something from beyond the soil goes down into the soil. So something from beyond us comes down into the earth so that heaven and earth can be made into a new creation. And something I love about this image is a plant's roots go down into the soil, but they extend into the skies, the heavens, the heavens and the earth are connected together by a plant and that plant is living. And what we know is the kingdom of God, that Jesus is that mustard seed that has gone into the soil and he connects heaven and earth with life. And he has invited us to be a part of that life. Another passage in the Bible says, unless a seed is sown into the ground and dies, there cannot be life. When a seed is sown into the soil, it cracks open. It's like it dies and new life erupts from it. We've all been in first grade where you take the little lima bean, you put it against the, the window seal of the science lab and you watch the, the lima bean grow out. That's what, that's what happens in the soil. New life comes from it. And so Jesus is like the seed in the ground. He takes all the brokenness of the world and he cracks it open. He crucifies it on the cross. All your shame, all your brokenness, all of it, even death itself is crucified on the cross. And through his love and his death and his sacrifice for us, that life is extended to us and we are able to be, to be part of this abundant life of God. And so both heaven and earth will be filled with his life and his love and that is what the kingdom of God is like. And you are invited to be part of it. God wants you to be a part of this kingdom. So the kingdom of God is growing out. It's growing in us and through us and around us even now. So that means what happens in this life matters to God. Your life matters to God now. And that's what I was struck by as we said the Lord's prayer at that field. We pray for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. The earth that we had just received the cabbages from, that is the earth that we were praying that the kingdom would come in. And so the lives that we live today are caught up in this new creation, in the kingdom of God, even now. It is slow work, slower than most of us would like, but our Lord is concerned with small things, the little things. And like a mustard seed, starting out small and growing into a place of rest for the birds, Jesus is bringing the kingdom of God all around us today. Amen.